And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and a moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast him to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered. And the woman brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And the child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against a dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. God is good, and all the time. Good evening, everyone. How was your day? So was mine. I'm glad to hear that. We must develop the habit of thanking God for all the little blessings we tend to take for granted. You drove from home or work to this place, no accidents, we thank God. So I thank him for a good day, and I hope that he will grant me his spirit so that I may deliver this message in a way that glorifies him and blesses all those who are listening. I welcome you all, and I welcome those who are connecting via the internet, Facebook, and YouTube, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining us, and I believe there are nations scattered all over the earth where people are right now listening to this presentation. And we're truly, truly, truly honored by your presence with us, and we're fairly confident that the Lord will speak to you through this message. And for those of you watching online, if you are not a Seventh-day Adventist, we are particularly delighted that you're with us, and we pray that God will specially bless you and speak to you in the area of your need and place a double blessing on your children. Is there anyone in this building who is not a Seventh-day Adventist? May I see your hand? You're not, you're just a guest. Well, not just, you are a guest. All right. Well, wherever our guests are, thank you very much. Our subject for today, I am anxious. What did I say? I am anxious. If you're not using one of these, please make sure they're turned off. I believe mine is turned off. I did so while I was sitting to my right. Favor number two, and the reason for that is phones should not be ringing in church. You can't have a phone in a courtroom ringing. Why would you have one ringing in the presence of a holy God? God deserves more reverence and respect than do earthly judges. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And that's what I want God to do for me. Favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's reason under the guidance of the spirit of truth. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you, Father, for your love. It's a love we do not understand in its depth. But we thank you, Father, for the clearest manifestation of that love, the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for life. We thank you, Father, for the honor we have of coming into your presence to listen to your voice through the spoken word. As we bow before you, dear God, if we have sinned against you, forgive us. And grant us that hatred for sin, Father, because the things we hate we avoid. We ask for the Holy Spirit to be sent upon us, 
The Bible says in Luke 11 13, If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? And so we ask, dear God, I ask you, Father, to receive me now as an instrument. I humble myself before you. I really do, insofar as I know how. Use me, dear God, as you see fit. I will offer no resistance. Keep me ever mindful that I am in this desk for your glory, not for mine. And so, Father, I invite you to suppress my carnal nature, which loves attention, and let the glory settle upon your most deserving name. Bless every country represented by those listening, Father. A special blessing on all our visitors, our guests who are not Adventists. Touch them, Father, in a very personal and loving way. Dear God, let this message lift some downtrodden soul, I pray. Bless the leaders of the countries. Let them make decisions that please you. And when you come into your kingdom, Father, and you're coming, save us without losing one. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I had intended to deliver a message tonight on prophecy, possibly Daniel 2 or 7 or Revelation 13. Then I got a text. I have some very good friends all over the world, so I texted one. I said, how are you? The person wrote back and said, I am anxious. And immediately the Holy Spirit said, lay aside the study on prophecy preach the sermon titled, I am anxious. And then the person proceeded to give me the details that led to that person's anxiety. It's, you, it may interest you to know that the Bible forbids God's people to be anxious. Did you hear what I said? The Bible forbids his people, God's people, to be anxious. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. We'll read from verse 25. Our subject, I am anxious. And while you're looking for Matthew 6, I must uh, state that there are millions of people who have lost their jobs or been temporarily suspended because of this COVID-19 and the closure of businesses and schools and many other organizations. Multiple thousands, millions have lost their jobs. Many have filed for unemployment figures not seen since the Great Depression of the late 1920s, early 1930s. And so there is widespread anxiety. Rent has to be paid. Groceries have to be bought. Children have to be clothed. These are not imaginary needs. These are pressing needs that people have in the millions in this, the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. And so a subject entitled I am anxious is very, very fitting for the times in which we live. Matthew 6, reading from verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Notice how Jesus closes verse 26. Are ye not much better than they? It's a question we have to answer. Who stands closer to God? A bird or a human being for whom Christ died? Who is God more willing to take care of? A crow or a Christian? And so Jesus says, are ye not much better than they? Verse 27. Which of you? by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature. And why take ye thought for him? In other words, why are you worried about clothes? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Now of the birds, he said, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Of the lilies, he said, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory, was not arrayed or dressed or outfitted like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? 
Therefore take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. So we're told three times, don't take thought. In other words, do not be anxious. And our title is, I am anxious. <laughs> so I'm out of step with what Jesus said, do not be anxious. The question then becomes, to whom did Jesus say, do not be anxious? Did he say that to the whole world? Did he say that to his disciples? To whom was Jesus speaking when he said, do not be anxious? Let's go to Matthew 5. We'll read from verse 1. Our subject, I am anxious, or I'm worried, or I'm stressed. I don't know where to turn. Matthew 5, reading from verse 1. I'll pray again, Father, as I continue, speak through me very directly to God and give hope to those listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 5, reading from verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. Jesus was addressing the disciples. Now, I quickly add, the multitudes obviously overheard because they always followed Jesus. When Jesus said, come me yourselves apart and rest a while, they went off into the wilderness, the multitude followed them. That's when Jesus fed them with 5,000 with fish and bread. And so the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was addressing his disciples because the lifestyle described in the Sermon on the Mount is not for an unbeliever. Is for the child of God. Having said that, let us go back to chapter 6. This time, we will read verse 24. Our subject, I am anxious. Matthew 6, verse 24. Do we have that? All right. No man can serve two masters. Question for you. How many masters do you serve? Is it God on the weekend and the devil during the week? Is it God on the weekend for two hours and mammon during the week? Who, how many gods or masters do we serve? Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve. God and mammon. In this verse, Jesus is calling upon us to examine our relationship with him, our loyalty to him. Are we 100% for Jesus with no room for the world? These are the ones Christ is addressing when he says, therefore I say unto you, take no thought. In other words, don't worry, don't be anxious. He is speaking to those who have clearly decided they will serve one master and that is Jesus. No man or woman of any race, tribe, ethnic group, educational level, edu economic status can serve two masters. And I must ask you again with respect, how many masters are we serving? If we look at the words Christ uses, we understand the severity of the choice that we must make. And I say again, the severity of the choice that we must make or the totality of the choice. Listen to the words of Christ. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. Now who are the two? God and Satan. Christ and the world or mammon. Jesus says, your acceptance of me must be so strong, the only reaction you have to the world 
is hatred. Which means you accept me as your Lord, your master, 100%. Hate one. Love the other. Hold to the one. Despise the other. The Bible is a book of sharp opposites. Romans 6, 8, 16. Know ye not that the whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, of obedience unto righteousness or life, whether of sin unto death, of obedience unto life. Opposites. Deuteronomy 30, 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. There is no similarity between life and death, no similarity between blessing and cursing. Why am I saying that? When someone loves Jesus and hates the world, it becomes very evident that that person belongs totally to God. To them, Jesus says, take no thought for your life. Because when you accept me that way, because I am your Lord, it becomes my responsibility to take care of you. Let me say it again. When you bring a child into the world, it's your responsibility to take care of that child. And if you fail, the government may take the child from you because the government acknowledges you are responsible for taking care of that child. Food, clothes, shelter, and a certain level of education. That's your responsibility. You are the parent. Jesus is saying, when I am your Lord, without competition from Satan, you have nothing to worry about. Therefore, I say unto you, Matthew 6, 25, take no thought for your life. What you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on when Jesus is here, your Lord 100%. Let's take a dramatic look at uh, this playing out in the life of a lady. 1 Kings 17, we read from verse 1. Our subject, I am anxious. 1 Kings 17, reading from verse 1, and by the way, I read from the King James Version of the Bible. First Kings, Old Testament, chapter 17, reading from verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto her Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Elijah tells Ahab, a drought, a famine is coming. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the book Kareth, that is before Jordan. Verse 4. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. A famine is coming on the land. God knows that. He's the one sending it in a certain sense. Elijah is his servant. 100%. And God tells Elijah, you go stay by that brook. Stay until I call you. I will send the ravens to feed you. I'll provide clear water in the form of a brook. Now, God hasn't changed. Somebody say amen. God has not changed. Verse 5. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the book Kereth, that is before Jordan. Verse 6. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning. And bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. This is Elijah. We read the Bible sometimes and we read it at certain events and we shake our heads and we close the book and walk away as if God can no longer do these things. 
We view God as different in the Old Testament from what he is represented as being in the New and surely from how he evidences himself in this modern age. We think that God is different. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with him whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James 1.17, Malachi 3 verse 6, I am the Lord, I change not. Hebrews 38, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. What God did back then, if God deems it necessary, he will do today. We must stop restricting God by showing him how difficult the situation is. A bad economy is a problem for me, not for God. Joblessness is a problem for me, not for God. God is omnipotent. Therefore, my intelligent decision must be get close to him. Verse 7 of 1 Kings 17. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belong to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. God is a God of variety. Now, he could have continued to use the ravens to satisfy and take care of Elijah, but he says, enough of ravens, now I'll use a widow woman to take care of you. Elijah didn't know that. All Elijah knew, this is my God, I'm faithful to him. He had no clue how he would be taken care of, and God told him. The lady did not know she was handpicked by God to take care of Elijah. There are people that God handpicks to be a blessing to other people. I've seen it in my own life over and over again. Let me say it again. There is someone listening to me. God has handpicked you to be a blessing to someone else. I've seen it in my life as blessings has come to me and I've seen it when God has used me to be a small blessing to somebody else. I have commanded it with a woman there to sustain thee. And he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Bring me some water. Bring me a piece of bread. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Now these are tough times the woman was in. We are in tough times right now in the United States and many other countries around the world because of the conditions imposed upon us by this thing called COVID-19, coronavirus. She said, I'm about to make the last cake. I'll split it between myself and my son. We will eat it and at least we'll die with something in our stomachs. Verse 13, listen carefully. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. Any preacher who tells someone that today will be described as cold, Heartless, unfeeling, brutal, self-seeking. To tell someone who's out of work, who just got a gift of $500, who has rent to pay, food to buy, tuition to pay, someone just generously gave $500, then the preacher tells that lady, you need to return a tithe and offering. And the world cannot understand why a preacher would be so harsh. That's not being harsh, that's being helpful. Elijah told that woman, 
make me thereof a little cake first. Now, when he said me, Elijah represented God. I understand that clearly. He represented God as verily as Moses represented God. Make it for me. In other words, put God first and bring it unto me. Make sure I am taken care of. When you've made it and you've brought it, then go take care of you and your son. That's putting God first. Regardless of economic conditions, God must be first. Now, someone like that falls under Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat. Verse 14 of 1 Kings 17. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the land. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And verse 15 ends this way. And she and he and her house did eat many days. I am the Lord. I change not. The cure for anxiety for the Christian is not alone. The cure for anxiety for the Christian is a total surrender to God. Knowing that God knows how to take care of his. Let me say it again, as harsh as it may sound. The cure for anxiety for a child of God is not alone. But to go to God in total surrender, offer yourself to him as his child, to hate the world, to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your might, with all your understanding, to make that surrender of yourself to him, knowing that God takes care of his, and then watch him take care of you miraculously. I was going to... Uh, some country in Africa, I don't remember which one, to do a series many years ago. I had left my job just to preach. The Lord told me, leave it, and I left it. Not easily, but I left it. And uh, I was sitting at home. I said, Father, I have to go and preach all the way across the world. I have no money. You go that far, you ought to have some money in your hand in case an emergency occurs or somebody needs help. Anyway, I said that to him, and I, the next day, my phone rang. And it was a member of a church where I used to be the local leader. Very nice guy. He said, Elder Skeet. I said, hi. How are you? Fine. What are you up to? Well, preparing to go preach. He said, I want to bless your ministry. <laughs> I said, well, I don't have a ministry. It's just me. <laughs> well, I want to bless you. <laughs> He said, meet me downtown. I said, okay. So I met him downtown. I thought he'd give me $200. He handed me $2,000. Just like that. Now, God decides how he blesses different people. I'm not saying he'd give you $2,000 tonight. He may give you $10,000. All I'm saying is, God decides how he will deal with us. He handed me $2,000. He's been blessed by my preaching. $2,000. And he went his way. I was at a, again, let me say, God blesses us in different ways. He may bless with material things. He may bless with money. He may bless any way he chooses that suits your circumstance. I was conducting a meeting in some part of the United States several years ago, maybe 12. I had very little money. And I'm preaching night after night, every night, three weeks, just like this. A lady and her husband came to me. She said, we want to bless you. <laughs> so I said, okay. But we wanted to go to you, not any ministry, you. And I said, well, my name is Randolph Skeet. <laughs> Write it to me. The next day, the lady handed me a card. $5,000. So I cleared my head from the, a state of dizziness, and I said, thank you. And I, first quiet moment I got, I thank God. I was uh, at home. And I got a call from a conference I used to work with. We have a letter here for you. I said, okay, send it to me. They sent it. 
Someone in some country I won't name was listening to my sermons, was touched. The Lord touched the person's heart. The person sent me from halfway around the world $2,000. And I said, Father, you know how to take care of your people. I was at home preparing to go somewhere. Because the Lord keeps me on the move, but he slowed me down with COVID-19. And uh, I got a letter. I opened it. Someone just sent me. <laughs> you holding on to your seats? $10,000. And about six weeks later, another 2000 And so you're looking at someone who knows what God can do. So when I tell you, the answer for anxiety is not, it is to get close to God. Make his will your will. Make his business your priority. And God is obligated to take care of what is his. My mother, many, many years ago, I usually don't tell a lot of stories, but this one just came to me. Many years ago, before I was born, my mother told me this. She moved from one island in the West Indies to another to be with my father, who was working in that place. And uh, she didn't know anyone in the area. My father was away for a while. So she was led to a house where she had to stay all by herself. And there was nothing in the house to eat. The next day, someone came to the house with some bags. Someone she didn't know of food and placed it on the porch and went off. My mother was a child of God. God rest her soul. She was a child of God. Tell you another story. And these stories I tell will serve me for the next five years. I'm not a story person. <laughs> when we were small, let me pray. Father, help me to tell these events accurately that someone may be inspired. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There were four of us in the house. My father would sail on ships. He'd be gone for months, years. Once my father left, I was eight years old. He came back when I was 21. Can you understand that? We were sailing the world. <laughs> I was eight when he left. He came back, I was 21. We hadn't seen him in all that time, 13 years. Anyway, he would send money every month from wherever he was. The shipping company would send the money. And for five months, no money came. And uh, my mother was pulling out her hair because four little children, she doesn't work. She's at home because she made a commitment. She's not leaving the house to work until her youngest child is an adult. That's a commitment she made. And she only left the house to work when her youngest child was 22. And uh, one day the spirit said to her, go to the post office. And so she went, and uh, she said to the postmaster, do you have any mail for Marie Skeet? He checked, he said, no. She said, could you check again? He checked, he said, no. So she dropped her head and she turned to go back to the house with four hungry children. And then the guy said, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's your name? She said, Marie Skeet. He said, wait. He went to the back, back, back room of the office and came back with five letters. <laughs> five. The five months. Somehow, the letters got lost in the post office. Hmm? And remember during that time, once we went searching the house for coins that fell under the bed, under the couch. We were searching for coins. We found a quarter. Went by six loaves of bread and brought that home. We found a quarter under a couch. God is good? Come on. A quarter will feed four children back then. Are you following me? We found a quarter, bought six loaves of bread, one each, if I remember the details. He brought back five letters, each one having money for that month, for the five months where nothing arrived. And tears came out of her eyes. What am I trying to tell you? God will try you sometimes. He must. He will test you. But God will never abandon you. And so let me speak to the person who lost his or her job. 
The Bible says in Genesis 2 verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. God is the first person in the Bible to work. He understands work. Are you with me? He understands work. Now the fourth commandment says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. If God commands me to work six days, he must do something to provide me with a job. I want to see the commandment isn't just rest. It's a commandment to work and to rest. So if you're a child of God, you go to God, you say, Father, you command me to rest and I rest. But the commandment also tells me to work. I need a job. Which will allow me to return a faithful tithe. Are you following me? You're homeless. God provided a home for Adam. These are not just words out of the air. This is reality. God built the first home. First person to work. First provision of food he provided. God knows how to take care of his, but we must be his. Now, you may see the wicked flourishing. Yes, Job saw that and was bothered. David saw it and almost lost his faith. But the wicked may flourish for now, and then they're gone. God's people may suffer for now, but they have an endless life of bliss and blessing ahead of them. God can take care of his people. What did I tell my friend who wrote me saying, I'm anxious? Recommit your life to God right now. Thank him for life. Thank him for the roof over your head. Thank him for your child. Thank you. Find things for which to thank God and then say to God, Father, as you have been kind to me in these areas, here is my need. Here is my area of suffering. Here is what I need, Father. And God, a God of mercy, a God of love, will interpose and intercede and intervene to ease your circumstance. God's children need not worry. When they went into the wilderness, fleeing from Egypt, Exodus 16, they were hungry. God is so good, they did not pray, they criticized and complained. But God is so good, he looked beyond the criticism and the complaints and he sent food from heaven. They were thirsty. They complained again. Chapter 17 of the book of Exodus. God is so good. He overlooked the criticism and the complaints and he brought water from a rock. I am telling you that when you are a child of God, God is obligated to take care of what is his. Let me also give you a word of comfort. Even if you're not a child of God, God still wants to bless you. Matthew 5, 45 that ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Go with me to Genesis 26 quickly. It's already 20 minutes to set to 8. Genesis 26, and let's look at another famine situation and see God work. Let's pray. Father, as I move to this part of the message, which is close to the end, be with me, speak through me, dear God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Genesis 26. The Bible says, and there was a famine in the land. Beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. In Genesis 12, Abraham had a famine and he ran down to Egypt and he spent some time there until the famine ended Then he came back. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. He was heading down towards Egypt. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in this land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, for I will be with thee, and will bless thee, for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. God told Isaac, You stay right where the famine is. Now this is not what I would tell somebody. If there's a famine in Minnesota, then you go to Wisconsin. If there's a famine in Wisconsin, go to South Dakota. Go where the food is. People move from one state to another because their job's in California, and so they leave New York. There are better schools in Florida, so I leave Arkansas. We go where the opportunities are. The opportunity for food was in Egypt, and God told Isaac, stay where you are. 
Because God works in mysterious ways. So he said, sojourn in this land. Verse 3, Genesis 26. For I will be with thee and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries. And I will perform the oath which I swear unto thy father Abraham. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because that Abraham kept my commandments, my statutes, my, and my laws. Now my charge and my laws. And the Bible says, verse 6, Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Let's go to verse 12. And Isaac sowed in that land. What land? The land where the famine was. He sowed. He planted a crop. And received in that year... What? 100 fold. Question for you. Can God give you a job in this jobless state? Yes. Mm -hmm. can, God, can God provide your needs in this time of stress? I'm trying to tell you, yes. God told Isaac, which was contrary to all counsel he might have received, stay where you are. I will bless you. It is better to be blessed by God in a desert than to be blessed than to be disobedient to him in a forest. I will bless you. And so the Bible says, and Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The man grew and went forward and became very great. For he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants. And the Philistines envied him. The Lord blessed him. He obeyed God. Listen to me. God can take care of you in any circumstance. Recommit your life to God. Be his. And he said, no one can pluck from my hand what is in my hand. Give your life to God. God will take care of you. He'll use people to take care of you. He'll arrange circumstances to take care of you. He will do it in remarkable ways that nature and teaching cannot understand when he used the ravens. How can someone understand a rain shower of bread? As in the case of manna. The Bible says he brought water from the rock of flint. Because with God, nothing shall be impossible Search your life. We search our lives, our hearts. Is this something in the life displeasing to God? Remove it. When I say remove it, confess it. Is this something in the life displeasing to God? Confess it. Remember when Achan, was it not Achan? Yes, Achan stole the Babylonian garment. And the entire Israelite nation lost the battle. Because one man disobeyed God just one in an entire nation we can apply that and say one sin in the life persistently cherished not confess can cause problems in the life what am I saying confess search me or you ask God to search you Psalm 139 verse 23 search me O God and know my heart try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting search me father is this something in me you ask God to do that, he'll show you. Also keep in mind, God sometimes brings us by a tough way to strengthen us. But in that tough way, he provides for us. The wilderness was tough. Every day, six days a week, they had food. Seven days a week, they had water. Seven days a week, they had air conditioning. Seven days a week, they had heating at night. All the basic necessities were provided seven days a week except food, which was six, and it was doubled up on Friday. So in essence, it was seven days a week. I am anxious is our subject. Why? I don't have a job. I don't have this. I don't have that. Let me give you the words of Christ again. Then we'll pray. I'll make an appeal. Then we pray. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat. Or what you shall drink. Nor yet for your body what you shall put on. That's Jesus. Speaking to those who call themselves his children. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? 
Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap. They don't even work, and God provides for them. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. It's unfair, it seems, to a human mind for God to feed a bird and not feed a person. Jesus died for people, not for birds. People were made in the image of God. Birds were not. But that's a comforting thought. If God takes care of animals, surely he'll take care of me. And the circumstances do not intimidate God. You know, um, on my front porch was a flower basket put there by my wife. And uh, birds built a nest. I don't know if I told you the story. They built a nest, a bird, right in the flower basket. I would look through the window of the front door and watch the bird come every day, sit on the eggs, sit on the eggs, sit on the eggs. Every day. And I told, I said, no one goes to this front door. No one comes in, comes to the garage door. I don't want that bird disturbed. Every day I'd watch it, every day. Then I saw three little heads pop up one day, you know, little chicks uh, uh, hatched. And I watched them, I watched them, and the little white patches on the head began to disappear, and feathers began. And they began, to grow, they began to grow big and big and big in the nest. And I was wondering how could three big birds that size fit in that little nest. And the mother would come with food, she'd come with food, she'd come with food. And I saw her putting food in the mouths. The mouths would open when she landed on the nest. And I watched them. And I prayed to God, I said, Father, please let me see them when they fly away. Let me see them. When they, but what I was marveling at, at how that bird would go, probably gone for two or three hours, then come back and feed those chicks. Jesus said, Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. I ask you, give yourself anew to God. The hand of God is the hand of protection. The hand of God is the hand of provisions. The hand of God is the hand of strength. The hand of God is the hand of defense against the devil. The hand of God is the hand of hope. Re recommit your life to God. Surrender to him again. Father, I'm your child. Here's my need. See what God will do. Someone tomorrow may have a testimony. See what God will do. Tell God that the conditions of society are no intimidation for him. Tell God that a jobless condition is not a problem for him. Tell God that famine is no problem for him. That a sea is no problem for him. That thirst is no problem for him. Tell God, remind him of what he has done and ask him to be merciful to you. As I said earlier, the Lord may touch someone to come to your aid, or the Lord may do it miraculously. There is no need to be anxious when the life is 100% in the hands of God. You don't believe me? Ask Daniel. Going to face lions, and he went. Ask the three Hebrew boys. Their problem wasn't food and drink. It was their lives. They walked into that fiery furnace. You ask Joseph. He went into prison, even though he was innocent, and God sustained his people. How many of you will say with me, Father, thank you for what you've done for me in the past. Take care of me from this day forward. Can I see your right hand? Take care of me. Hands down. Now, another. Father, use me to be a blessing to someone who's suffering. Can I see your hand? Ah, stand up with me. As bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, we thank you for the way you provide. There's more to life, dear God, than meat and drink, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 25. But Father, you made us physical. You made us physical. Consequently, we have physical needs. Yes, we have to pray. But Father, there's a physical need we have. We need food. Some of us need jobs. We need to provide for our children. And this COVID-19 came from somewhere and has turned society upside down. Maybe, Father, you allowed it for any kind of reason of which we're not aware it could be to open your people's eyes to see that they need to reevaluate their faith in you. But, Father, 
Our feet are on solid ground and we have solid needs. Provide for us, dear God. But first, forgive our sins. Forgive our sins, God. And implant within us that little bit of divine common sense that says, give yourself completely to God. Because when we do that, you, Father, feel obligated to take care of us. That lady listening to me, dear God, with little children and no job, no husband, have mercy on her father. That honest man who took care of his family, now he's lost his job, he doesn't know where to turn, have mercy on him, dear father. That person who's sick from COVID-19, your child, touch that person, dear God, because you said in Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord that healeth thee. That person, their God, whose house is about to be repossessed in the name of Jesus Christ, Father. Touch the heart of the banking officials that they may extend the time. Save that person's home, dear God. That person's car that's about to be repossessed by the repo man. Do something, God, and save that person's means of transportation to get to work. Father, demonstrate your mercy as you have in the past and touch the lives of your people with concrete assistance in these difficult times and choose us as you see fit to be a blessing to others who are suffering. Hear this humble prayer, God. In Jesus' name I pray with thanksgiving for what you've already begun to do. In Jesus' name, let God's people say amen and amen. God bless you. Come back tomorrow. Bring someone with you. And may the Lord watch over you tonight and your children.